Hello, and welcome to People of the Pod, brought to you by American Jewish Committee. Each week, we take you beyond the headlines to help you understand what they all mean for America, Israel, and the Jewish people. I'm your host, Manya Brashear Pashman. This week, we bring you Voices from Tel Aviv. I spoke with Yotam Pulitzer, the CEO of Israel, about the importance of sharing Israel's expertise and technology with the world's most vulnerable. But first, hear are from some podcast listeners who stopped by our podcast booth at AJC Global Forum 2023 to tell us why they love Israel. Listeners, the mic is yours. My name's Corey Sarku. I'm from Chicago. My name is Hannah Geller, and I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My name is Irvin Ungar. I'm from Burlingame, California, which is near San Francisco. As for why I love Israel, there are so many reasons. I think culturally, Israel is kind of a crazy place. Everyone is very welcoming. They're almost aggressively welcoming in a way. Like one of the first things, they meet you for five minutes and they're already calling you Achi, which means my brother. Uh, It goes along with the whole theme that really the Jewish people were all one big family and Israel is just the natural manifestation of that in a state. I love Israel because it's the place where I feel most at home. I love how in Israel I can walk on the street, I can be on the bus with someone and a stranger will invite me to Shabbat dinner. I love how the woman at the pool will just hand her baby over to me if she has something else to be tending to, and I've never seen her in my life. The reason I love Israel is I've been here several dozen times, and the first time I arrived, I do remember feeling like I was coming home. The question is why I left if I'm still coming home, and I've been here that many times, but nonetheless, that's the way I feel. I'm with my people. I'm with my people when I'm not in Israel. These are like my brothers, so I'm here. That's why I'm here. Yotam Pulitzer joined Israel, Israel's preeminent humanitarian aid organization, in 2011. In fact, he was the NGO's second employee. Since then, he has flown on dozens of aid missions, personally helping more than a quarter million people after some of the world's worst disasters. In 2017, he took over Israel as its chief executive officer and has since expanded the reach of Israeli disaster aid around the world. Earlier this year, he received the Charles Bronfman Prize, a $100,000 award given to a Jewish humanitarian under 50. Yotam is with us now in Tel Aviv. Yotam, welcome to People of the Pod. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So first, thank you for all you are doing to quite literally repair the world. Uh, Tell us about your upbringing and what led you up that particular Jewish professional path. So I don't think anyone, (laughs) myself included, you know, I, I wasn't thinking that I will end up chasing disasters around the world in places like the tsunami in Japan or the Ebola outbreak, or most recently, uh, Afghanistan, where we had a very dramatic operation. I grew up in a small village, in a small moshav in the north part of Israel. My father is a social worker. My mom was a school counselor and, you know, had a beautiful childhood. And then before my military service in the IDF, I did something, it's kind of a gap year. We call it in Hebrew, Shnat Jerut, which translates to service year. It's kind of a volunteering year before the military service. And I did that with youth at risk. Many of them are from Ethiopia, Ethiopian Jews. It was an incredible year, probably one of the most meaningful years of my life. And, and I kind of developed my passion, not just for service, but also for working with people from other cultures. Essentially, using humanitarian work, not only to save lives, but also to build bridges. And I learned so much from the Ethiopians that I worked with at that time. And then after my army service, like every Israeli, I followed what we call the Hummus Trail, which is this, uh, you know, crazy phenomenon where like about 50,000 Israelis every year are traveling, um, backpacking after the army to kind of clear their heads from the tension of the service. 
as most people go to India or South America. I went to India and it's called the Hummus Trail because the locals are starting to make hummus for the Israelis that are traveling. <laughs> so I was following the Hummus Trail. Hummus was not highly recommended. In uh, India? In India, yeah, it has a bit of a curry taste to it. But I ended up arriving to Nepal and I was planning to trek in the Himalayas. And, and I did that for a couple of weeks. And then I saw an ad that invited backpackers to volunteer with street children in Nepal, of all places. And I thought, well, it sounds cool. I'll do it for a couple of weeks and continue to Thailand or wherever I was going. I ended up staying there for three and a half years. I really fell in love with that kind of work. I came back to Israel and wanted to start my life. And two weeks after I came back to Israel, that was 2011, the tsunami in Japan happened. You know, a mega disaster. More than 20,000 people lost their lives. Half a million people lost their homes. And Israel, which was at that time a tiny organization with basically one employee and a few volunteers, offered me to lead a relief mission to Japan. Again, I was supposed to go for two weeks, and I ended up staying there for three years. So that's how kind of it all started for me. And also for Israel, interestingly enough, it used to be very much just a disaster response organization. And it's still part of our DNA. But in Japan, we realized that for us, our impact could be not just immediate relief and you know pulling people out of the rubble and giving them medical support, et cetera. Also, we need to look at long-term impact. And in Japan, you know, a rich country, third largest economy, they didn't really need our support with immediate relief. But what we supported them with was trauma care for children, which again is an area that unfortunately in Israel, not because everything is so perfect here, but because of our ongoing challenges from the trauma of the Holocaust to the ongoing conflict. We really developed this expertise to help children cope with trauma. So that's sort of how I started. And then from Japan, I went to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which was terrifying. Every night I used to wake up full of sweat. It's one of the symptoms of Ebola, but thank God I, I'm okay. And then I led a mission in Nepal after the earthquake they had. And there we actually had a very dramatic search and rescue operation. And we found the last survivor of the earthquake, who was a woman trapped under the rubble for six days without food or water. And then I led a relief mission to Greece with the Syrian refugees, actually also in partnership with AGC. Some of AGC team members actually joined me. It was amazing, you know, these people were considered our enemies and then all of a sudden they received support from us. So we can touch base on that later. So basically I was chasing disasters until 2017 when I was offered to co-lead the organization first as a co-CEO and then from 2019 as the, as the global CEO. So now, you know, we started as employee number two. Now we have about 350 of us in 16 countries. And uh, it's just an amazing privilege. And, I, and I'm still learning every day. That's, that's what keeps me going. In 16 countries, how are those countries identified and selected as locations for Israel aid? So for Israel, and it may sound bad, but for us, disasters are opportunities. And it doesn't mean that we sit down and wait for disaster to happen. They will happen whether we like it or not. And it could be, you know, climate-related disaster like a hurricane or a tsunami or earthquake or man-made disaster like what's happening in Ukraine or in Afghanistan when the Taliban took over. Or it could be even a pandemic like what we all just experienced, you know, a global crisis. So... Whenever there's a crisis somewhere in the world, and it could be in a neighboring country like Turkey, where we just had an earthquake, or in you know the most remote places on Earth like Vanuatu, near Fiji, we have an emergency response team that will deploy. Many times in partnership with AJC, we will send an emergency response team to send to do two things. One, to provide immediate relief, but two, to look for partners. And the partnership part is crucial because we can't really do anything by ourselves. What about inside Israel? Do you do anything? No, I mean, our mandate, and Israel was established 22 years ago, actually, by a group of activists. And the vision was to bring Israeli expertise to the world's most vulnerable communities around the world. Essentially saying, you know, Israel, again, not because everything is so perfect here, because of our challenges, we developed technologies and techniques and, and methodologies that could and should be shared with disaster areas around the world. So many of the original members were actually doctors and nurses and people who were active here on a day-to-day -day basis, but wanted to share this know-how and expertise with the world. Why? Why not just keep it for yourselves? First of all, for several reasons. One, because we are global citizens and we are 
influenced and influencing the world. And we should be a force for good. And it's really just the right thing to do. That's one. Two, because we actually have an added value. We have unique expertise and unique experience that people don't have. Everyone calls Israel the startup nation, right? So we see ourselves as the humanitarian wing of the startup nation. And we also a little bit self-criticize. We think we should do more as Israelis and as Israel. So we're doing the best we can. We are reaching millions, but we should reach billions. And the third reason, and that's also one of the reasons the organization is called Israel, is that it's also an opportunity to build bridges. And I think that's where uh, the AGC partnership is crucial because AGC is all about building bridges, right? Between the Jews and the world, if you will. And that's where I think there's such a beautiful alignment of values and of the mission and vision of how, again, terrible crises and tragedies could become a game changer in building bridges. And these bridges could be built with Syrian refugees who were considered our enemies. I remember I always quote a Syrian guy, you know, after we pulled out his daughter in Greece and we treated her, she almost drowned. He told me my worst enemy became my biggest supporter. Or a group of 200 Afghans that we, we pulled out that are now sending me Shabbat Shalom every Shabbat. So that's kind of the obvious, right? But, but there's a lot of bridges that need to be built also with our friends. You know, whether it's in Guatemala, which is a country that's very, you know, supportive of Israel, but like... But we are supporting them. So our goal at Israel is not to, we're not here to do diplomacy work or we're not dealing with politics. But at the same time, we do see ourselves as representatives of the Israeli civil society. And we do see how an added value of our work, these very strong bridges that are being built both on the high level and on the people to people connection. Have you ever encountered people who are not willing to accept help from Israeli agencies? So... Honestly, it almost never happened. In 99.5% of the cases, people were very happy to receive support from Israelis and from Israel. Sometimes people did not expect it. So I would say they were positively shocked uh, to receive support. But I think they were happy for several reasons. One is because it actually helped. Two is because we're not just there for short term. We're actually staying longer than most organizations. So we arrive in the first 72 hours but we are typically, you know, staying at an average of five years in an area. So it's really, we really build trust and people see that it's not just, you know, a token support. Um, free, we have a very strong kind of multicultural team, right? When I mentioned the Syrian refugees, uh, we had a lot of Arab Israelis, people who speak Arabic, uh, who were able to provide the support. So it's not only professional, it's also a strong cultural understanding and, and many of our local team members. The only cases I would say which was a little bit complicated and challenging was when we actually worked inside countries that don't have diplomatic relations with Israel. So with Syrians, we didn't work inside Syria, we worked with Syrians who escaped. Same with Afghanistan, we helped people evacuate from Afghanistan, but we didn't send our team inside. We did send our team inside Iraq, inside Bangladesh, and for security reasons mainly, our local partners knew where we're from, but the local government didn't. So we had to be much more careful in terms of our visibility. We couldn't wear our T-shirts and our logos, mainly for safety and security reasons for our staff. That's obviously a challenge. I mean, politics is there whether we like it or not. So in those situations, do you feel like you make headway with the citizens, with the public that you're helping that may have a long-term effect on how the governments consider Israel in the future? Or is that something that you care about? I mean, we do care. We are from here and the organization is called Israel and probably my life would have been easier if I would be working for the UN or working for Doctors Without Borders or for other organizations that don't have any affiliation with Israel, right? So we do care. We do care about building bridges and we do care about changing people's perspective. One story that I have was from Sierra Leone, West Africa. During the Ebola crisis, we worked with the First Lady and she was shocked to receive support from the other side of the world, from Israel. said, so you came from Israel all the way. I, I promise that, you know, when Sierra Leone will be Ebola free, me and my husband will come to visit Israel. And she actually followed her promise. So, you know, that was like a very clear kind of diplomatic aspect. Now, when we went to Malawi, also in partnership with AJC, following terrible cyclone that they had, the president was the one who welcomed us and said how excited he is for this support. When we talk about the Syrian refugees, we have supported over the years, we worked there for six years, 
about 120,000 of them. So we do believe it goes a long way, right? It's not just one or two people. It's not just anecdotal. Whether it will lead to a political change in the Middle East, maybe, hopefully, it definitely does change perspectives of hundreds of thousands of people. What is the budget of Israel? So this year we're close to $23 million. We tripled ourselves in the last two years. Again, not because everything is great, but because the world has gone mad and it was a series of events that we responded to, whether it's you know Afghanistan and Ukraine, of course, which is an ongoing disaster, and uh, Turkey and others. So yeah, so we are in 23 million. Um, we are growing and planning to grow to $50 million in the next few years, which is really what we believe we need in order to continue responding in the countries where we are and have some kind of an emergency fund that enables us to respond to new crises. By the way, I want to say that that's where AJC has been an incredible partner because AJC, I think, supported us in more than 20 countries over the last few years. And one of the main challenges is that there's a disaster in country, country X and we need seed funding. We need to be able to deploy immediately. And that's typically what AJC provides. And by the way, it's in, in places that are all over the media, like Ukraine, for instance, or, or in places like Malawi that no one heard of. And that's crucial because we know, unfortunately, that media attention equals to donor attention. So when things are in the media, it's much easier to raise funds. It's also limited, right? It's usually like a week or two, and then people move to the next tweet. I mean, you're an expert, so you probably know that. But AGC has been there on both kind of the more high profile and low profile and really has been an incredible partner that really enabled us. Because once you're on the ground, it's not only that you're saving lives, which is, you know, our main goal. It's also you build partnership and relationship and you're able to communicate to the world that you're doing that so you can raise more money. Mm -hmm. So deploying quickly is important for several reasons. And AGC, you know, basically enabled us to do that. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's huge for us. If someone wants to volunteer for ISRA aid, are there opportunities to do that? There are opportunities to do that, although I do have to say something because there's, we were based more on short-term volunteers in the past, and there's a serious problem with that. Many people who come for short-term are actually doing more damage than good. I mean, they come with great intentions, but they start something that, you know, there's no continuation, or they take a lot of pictures with children in Africa. It, there's, it's a very criticized field. Now, having said that, there are still people who have specific expertise, surgeons, for example, eye surgeons, you know, in a few days of volunteering, they could save people's lives, right? So we're not against it. It needs to be people with highly, who are highly skilled or people who can commit for long-term. And we do take interns, for example, college students, mainly graduate students, not so much undergrad, from specific fields who are looking for professional fellowship or internships in many of the countries. So there are definitely opportunities both for younger and for people who are young at heart, but the expertise or the long-term commitment is crucial. Responding to those kinds of crises, how does that reflect Jewish values? In other words, how do some of these crises contradict or almost violate Jewish teachings, Jewish values, and how much of a role does that play in you coming in to address it? So I think, you know, our team, just to clarify, is not just Jewish, right? We have Jews, Christians, Muslim, Buddhist, you know, other people. So it's a very diverse team from any perspective, definitely from a religious perspective. However, I think many of our team members are inspired by Jewish values. I mean, there's the obvious one of tikkun olam, which I think it's almost became a buzzword. I heard so many people use it. So we almost don't use it because it became such a buzzword, but... Essentially, how we interpret this Jewish value is our responsibility to look beyond just our community and to support, you know, the world's most vulnerable communities and really, literally, repairing the world or supporting the repairment of the world. So that's kind of the clear connection. I do think that everything that related to helping the strangers, right, people who are not just from our city or from our immediate community, Uh, is something that we strongly, strongly believe in. I mean, there's a story that I always share about Ukraine. If you are a Ukrainian Jew 80 years ago, you are, during the World War II, you are at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, right? You are likely to be slaughtered by the Nazis or by the Ukrainian collaborators. And today, in Ukraine, the Jewish community, there's a big Jewish community there, 
are receiving so much support, which is amazing to think about it from a historical perspective. They are entitled to support from the Israeli government and from the Jewish agency and from the JDC and from so many great organizations who are focusing on supporting Jews in Ukraine. I don't know if you, you heard that, but in the beginning of the war, when uh, millions of people fled Ukraine, the Jews were told, the Jewish refugees were told to put a sign with the letters IL for Israel, and they were taken out of the lines and prioritized. So the tables have turned, right? Which is amazing. However, what we take from it is that we have responsibility. That's why it's so important that now Jews and Israelis show the world that we support everyone, not just Jews, and that we are different and that we are there for everyone. And we are there even for people who are considered our enemies. My last question is, I have to admit, every time you've talked about vulnerable people, I hear you say valuable. I, I just, I've been mishearing you. But then I, I think, well, valuable, vulnerable, one and the same. And I'm curious what you have learned from communities and people that you have served in this capacity, and also whether they have gone on to teach and volunteer and help and pay it forward? It's a great question, uh, and I liked it. I never heard this person, but that's exactly how not only me, but all of our team members feel like. Vulnerable, our communities are also extremely valuable. And in many places, we see our role, not just in bringing the expertise and the know-how, but actually, in a way, putting a spotlight on local expertise and local know-how. And that's how in many of our countries of operation now, the people who are leading the response are actually local members of the community who, you know, received some training and support from us, but actually bringing their own cultural expertise. And we've been learning so much from these people, again, from languages to cultures to how you find, you know, very innovative solutions when there are very limited resources. It's a really two-way street of learning. And now many of our team members on the regional level, actually, when there is a crisis in a neighboring country, together with our team from Israel, they respond. So now in Malawi, for instance, we send a team from Israel and Kenya together. When there is another crisis in the Caribbean, we send a team from Dominica because they know they're, they're there. So practically it's much quicker and, and they understand the local culture and context. So definitely a big part of our role is to build this global team of disaster responders who can respond to disasters both globally and locally and in the region. So we see how that becomes a bigger part of our strategy now to utilize local and regional resources to support communities at risk. So it's not only we're coming from the West sort of with this know-how, we're combining that with local know-how and expertise. You're not just parachuting in and imposing your solutions. Exactly. We co-create solutions. Yo, Tom, thank you so much. Really appreciate you sharing this time with us. Thanks for having me, and thanks for a wonderful partnership with AJC throughout the years. If you missed last week's episode, be sure to listen to AJC Chief Policy and Political Affairs Officer Jason Isaacson as he breaks down last week's passage of Israel's Reasonableness Standard Law and what it means for Israel's democracy and security. Thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by AJC. Our producer is Atara Lakritz. Our sound engineer is TK Broderick. You can subscribe to People of the Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or learn more at ajc.org slash people of the pod. The views and opinions of our guests don't necessarily reflect the positions of AJC. We'd love to hear your views and opinions or your questions. You can reach us at peopleofthepod at ajc.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to tell your friends, tag us on social media with hashtag people of the pod, and hop on to Apple Podcasts to rate us and write a review to help more listeners find us. Tune in next week for another episode of People of the Pod.